Hello, everyone, and welcome to this virtual event hosted by the Atlantic Council's Middle East programs. My name is Will Wexler, and I'm director of the Rafiq Hariri Center in Middle East programs here at the Atlantic Council. We're really delighted that you could join us today for this discussion. The report that we're launching today is part of a growing body of work that we're developing in this program on a very important topic, the role of China uh, in the Middle East. Um, it has changed. Over the last decade, it's expanded, it's growing, it's becoming more important. Um, and uh, we all need to uh, really understand what's true and what's false about the role that China plays. Dr. Jonathan Fulton is the author of our new report um, and the lead expert on the topic. And we're very glad to publish, um, publish this paper, this one on the Sino-Saudi um, relationship uh, entitled Author of Strangers, uh, he's the author of Strangers to Strategic Partners, uh, 30 Years of Sino-Saudi Relations. Um, you can go on our website and you can find it immediately. It's really a, a tremendous piece. The, um, uh, the idea for this paper, came from our recognition that this is, of course, the 30th anniversary of the relationship, the diplomatic relationship formally between China and Saudi Arabia. It's been 30 years since Prince Bandar bin Sultan, then Saudi ambassador to the United States, and of course, father to the current Saudi ambassador to the United States, was sent to Beijing to negotiate establishing full diplomatic relations with China and the kingdom. You know, where has this relationship gone since then? Where is it, where is it likely to go in the future? And the perspective of the Atlantic Council here in Washington, you know, uh, how does this affect U.S. national security interests and foreign policy? Um, we hope that this report that we're issuing today and the conversation that we're going to have on this virtual event will begin to address some of these very important questions and, and raise likely uh, more for consideration. The issues on the table range from energy trade to nuclear power competition to human rights to technology and security. And I'm very interested to hear what all our distinguished speakers have to say on this topic. Dr. Jonathan Fulton, who I've mentioned previously, is a non-resident senior fellow here at the Atlantic Council. He's coming to us today from Abu Dhabi, where he's assistant professor of political science at Zayed University. Uh, Jonathan has written widely on the topic of China policy towards the Middle East, for both policy and for academic audiences. Um, he completed his uh, doctorate studies um, uh, at the University of Leicester, and where his dissertation focused on Chinese relations um, with the Gulf Cooperation Council's member states. Jonathan will be joined on this panel by Dr. Wu Bingbing of Peking University. Professor Wu is calling in from Beijing, where he's senior research fellow at Peking University's Institute for International Strategic Studies. Deputy Director of the University's Department of Arabic Language and Culture and Director of the University's Institute of Arab Islamic Studies. Professor Wu is widely published on China Middle Eastern relations and politics of the contemporary Middle East. And next we have uh, Dr. Mohammed Al Sudari, who is a non resident researcher and head of the Asian Studies Institute at the King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies, which is a think tank based in Riyadh. He too is an expert on Sino-Middle East relations and Chinese politics. He received his PhD in comparative politics from the University of Hong Kong. The Atlantic Council's own Kirsten Fontenrose will join us um, on the panel, the only one besides me to be joining from the Washington DC area. Um, and she will approach these questions from a US policy perspective. Uh, Kirsten is director of our Scowcroft Middle East Security Initiative and has held positions across uh, the US Department of Defense, Department of State, and in the White House, where she was uh, responsible for portfolios in Middle East security. Her most recent government position was senior director for the Gulf states at the National Security Council, where she led the development of US policy towards the GCC states, amongst others. Uh, that certainly included considerations of China's engagement in the region. And finally, uh, we're really glad to have as our moderator today, Richard McGregor, who's calling in from Sydney, where he's a senior fellow at the Lowy Institute. Richard is a longtime journalist, uh, most recently the head of the Washington office of the Financial Times, after having served as bureau chief in Beijing and Shanghai. Richard has also written several books on Chinese politics and foreign policy. Um, in just a moment, I'm gonna hand the program over to Jonathan, who will start with a brief presentation on uh, his report. And then our panelists will engage in a moderated discussion. After you know, a round or two of questions uh, with each speaker, we'll then open up questions from the audience. Please submit them in, through the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. 
Um, uh, thank you very much for logging on and let's get started. Jonathan, over to you. Okay, thank you, Will. And thanks uh, to everybody for joining us. This is really an absolute game team panel. Uh, really wonderful to be joined by, by people who kind of admire us so much. Um, Will did a really great job of setting this up. Um, of course, the rationale for for doing this uh, report this year was that this is the anniversary of uh, China's uh, diplomatic relations with Saudi. Uh, of course, those big round numbers always are a good occasion to, to do something like this. But there are also a lot of things happening between China and Middle East this year, China Saudi, uh, Saudi hosting the T20, uh, virtually, I guess, now. Um, the China Arab States Cooperation Forum Ministers Meeting, which was held in virtually again in Jordan this summer. Uh, it just seemed to be kind of a, a substantial year for China Middle East relations. And it seemed a good opportunity to, to look at a very important bilateral relationship that like China's engagement in, in the Middle East. Um, events in, in the past few months have certainly reiterated that. We had uh, Secretary Pompeo's trip to Jerusalem in May, which seemed to really, uh, I guess, reshape the direction or, or um, the, the, the engagement of China's uh, relations with Middle East partners and allies of the US. Uh, we had the leaked details of the China-Iran um, uh, Conference of Strategic Partnership, and you know, that's been getting a lot of uh, my opinion, hype, but uh, certainly a lot of recognition in the past couple of months. Uh, there was a story in the Wall Street Journal just a couple of weeks ago about uh, China-Saudi cooperation on, on nuclear uh, issues. And of course, the very dramatic um, announcement that the Israel and the UAE were normalized relations. So there's been a lot of things that have brought uh, a deeper focus, I think, into how China's happened um, over the past uh, couple of months that made something like this um, a little more relevant. I think the value of a report like this is that looking over the span of 30 years uh, gives us a bit of a long view and allows us to escape the, the tyranny of the headlines. I can think of two issues that I wrote about in this report. Um, one being what I just mentioned, the, uh, the story of China-Saudi cooperation in um, the field of nuclear energy. This has been a lot of press since this article came out. Uh, but again, this isn't new. This is something that China's been working towards for quite some time. Uh, this, you can see the roots in this in uh, Xi Jinping gave during the uh, 2014 China Arab States Cooperation Forum, in which he emphasizes one plus two plus three co uh, cooperation for working with these two countries, in which he was focused on nuclear energy as, uh, as something China wanted to develop a bigger presence. Uh, another issue which I wrote about in this report that's gotten uh, some, some headlines recently was the, um, the MOU that was signed between Saudi Aramco and Aramco to develop a, a $10 billion project, uh, a refinery in uh, Liaoning. And this was announced last year. It's also generated quite, quite a lot of buzz. And there was a story in Bloomberg earlier uh, this week or later last week, I guess, that Saudi Aramco was pulling out. This was immediately followed by a, a, a statement yesterday in the Arab News from Saudi Ramco CEO, um, I mean Nasser, that they actually were pulling out. So if we were just following the, the headlines, you know, our heads would be spinning all the time and, and trying to, it'd be quite hard to make sense of what's going on in this, in this relationship, what's going on in, in uh, I guess, the broader context of China and the Middle East. So in writing this report, uh, there were two generally broad themes that I, I kept coming back to. What's in it for China? And what's in it for the Saudis? Uh, for China, uh, I see there's three general um, points. Uh, obviously, the one that's generated the most recognition over the years is Saudi's role as an energy superpower seems to be driving a lot of the relationship. Uh, if we only look at energy, we're getting a, a much more narrow image of what the relationship is about. However, uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative, which was announced in 2013 as a strategic element, and Saudi's geostrategic location makes it a very important partner for China in what it's trying to achieve in the BRI in the Middle East. And the third big point is Saudi's uh, role as a leader in global Islam. Uh, China, of course, is a country with a very substantial Muslim population. Uh, Saudi's leadership in, in, in setting a lot of the, uh, the norms in Islam globally is, is, is quite important for China. Uh, what's in it for Saudi? Well, uh, again, 
Um, energy can't be under under mind. Uh, it's it's a long term energy market. China's the world's biggest importer of, of, of uh, crude oil. Um, Saudi is the largest exporter. This is a very uh, complementary uh, relationship. But also beyond that, uh, China, Saudis rolled out their own big program, the uh, Saudi Vision 2030, and this requires a lot of foreign expertise, a lot of foreign investment, a lot of foreign contracting. In, in issues that China's got quite a lot of expertise. So the, the, the complementary nature between BRI and Saudi Vision 2030 is also something that's quite important to the Saudis. Uh, and third, which is something else that, that leads to, I guess, the bigger picture is just the diversification of great power partnerships uh, for Saudi Arabia. Um, the, the US politically has, has made it pretty clear on both sides of the aisle, both Republicans and Democrats in recent years have, have indicated that a, a smaller political U.S. and Middle East is, is politically desirable. Uh, this is consistent with what the U.S. public seems to be indicating. And I think a lot of countries in the Middle East are looking at this and thinking, well, it's time to make provisions for uh, maybe a, a less deep uh, U.S. footprint. So they're engaging with a lot of ex-regional powers. And in this, China's not unique. We've seen Russia become a more important regional actor in recent years. Uh, there's certainly a lot of room for India. Uh, Japan has made nascent steps in this direction. Europe has become a bigger actor as well. So Saudi has been diversifying its relationships and, and China, again, because of PRI, I think has a very clearly articulated vision of how this would work. Now, the big picture, of course, is that it's more than a bilateral relationship. It has to be seen both in a regional context and in the larger international context. Regionally, um, as, as, as I hinted at earlier, uh, we, we know that China is a very important partner to Iran. Uh, China's also got a lot of uh, important partnerships with other countries in the Middle East. So its relationship with, the Saudi, with Saudi Arabia has to be seen in, in the context of its broader regional ambitions. Uh, but more important is, is the role of the U.S. And of course, um, the Saudi leadership has to weigh the utility of engagement with China against the cost of uh, possibly antagonizing the U.S. Um, that's been made quite clear on issues like uh, 5G, for example. Um, but it works the other way as well. China also has to consider is the value of uh, pursuing a deeper role in, in, with a, a major U.S. ally worth the cost of antagonizing the U.S., every China considers very uh, critical for, for its regional ambitions. So, um, I think I'll stop here, but I think really uh, it's, it's a very fascinating relationship and uh, I, I look forward to hearing what some of our other panelists have to say about it. Um, and, and thanks, I'll stop here. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Jonathan, and I commend the paper, a very sharp and well-written exposition of all these issues uh, that we're talking about today. Kirsten, I want to come to you first. Um, we're in an era, as we all know, of heightened US-China competition. But at the same time, uh, Saudi is diversifying its, um, Saudi Arabia is diversifying its relationships, not just with China, but with many other countries. Now, that's no doubt beneficial to Saudi Arabia and China. Um, but, you know, on top of that, a lot of other interests come into play. Um, it is, how does the US see burgeoning Sino-Saudi ties? Uh, does it have any concerns about it? Uh, and if so, how would you describe those concerns? U.S. policy regarding China in the Gulf and Saudi Arabia in particular is, is not a policy in the vacuum. Um, the actions and objectives of China globally impact how Saudi Arabia's relationship with China is interpreted in Washington. So what Saudi leadership may see as an overreaction on issues like Huawei, for example, should be considered in the context of events in the South China Sea and Hong Kong and of Chinese strategies like using U.S. shell companies to undermine the U.S. defense supply chain. China's top ranked position in the U.S. hierarchy of threats is due to China's economic strength, sophisticated strategies for undermining that supply chain again, and robust propaganda and soft power machines. Add to this that the nuclear program of concern in the Korean Peninsula is so much further along than Iran's that it might actually pose a threat to the U.S. homeland. To illustrate this difference in black and white, just refer to the current U.S. national security strategy. The statement on the Middle East commits the United States to retaining the necessary U.S. military presence in the region to protect the U.S. and our allies from terrorist attacks and preserve a favorable regional balance of power. But the more 
far, the far more strongly worded commitment regarding the Indo-Pacific is to maintain a forward military presence capable of deterring and, if necessary, defeating the adversary. Another indication that the U.S. policy on China and Saudi Arabia does not exist in a vacuum is the decision um, that was pretty recent this summer to end a company deployments of U.S. troops in the Gulf. This happened just as Assistant Secretary of State David Schenker delivered an unambiguous admonition about cozying up to China to Gulf partners on June 4th on the heels of a similar message delivered to Israel by Secretary Pompeo underscores that no partner is too important, no ally too close for the U.S. to overlook things like the building of Chinese ports or purchasing of Chinese weapons and the integration of certain Chinese technologies into enterprise networks also touched by the U.S. when there are options. In fact, you know, coming from close partners and allies, this activity is actually less forgivable. Gulf Nation insistence that their deepening relations with China should be perceived not as a threat to the U.S. because the U.S. Is a strategic partner and China is their trading partner is understood in Washington. But there's a bipartisan belief that it's not in America's interest to use U.S. taxpayer money and American troops to make the Gulf a safe place for China to do business. So while Saudi feels it has no choice but to hedge its bets against U.S. disengagement from the region, the U.S. sees China's expanding, or I'm sorry, sees Saudi's expanding ties with China forged largely behind closed doors as a betrayal of sorts, and it directly impacts U.S. willingness to share cutting-edge military technologies and to leave troops in place. Really quickly, you know, if what is the U.S. perception that Saudi is turning toward China and away from the U.S. based on? I can walk you through four reasons pretty briefly. First. The kingdom is purchasing and integrating technologies into their kinetic, artificial intelligence, and cyber operations that are not interoperable with U.S. partner systems and, in fact, a threat to them. For example, last summer, the U.S. intelligence community learned that Saudi Arabia is expanding its ballistic missiles program using purchases from China. Second, despite very clear conveyance of the assessment by the U.S. intelligence community that Huawei is a $100 billion Chinese intelligence collection platform and the US sanctions that back up that assertion with action. Saudi Arabia awarded this July a contract that makes a Huawei 5G network the backbone of NEOM, the megacity in the north. The US discovery three weeks ago of a uranium yellow cake extraction facility in the northwest that um, Jonathan referred to briefly. This facility, as described by the kingdom, does not violate any international nuclear oversight agreements. But that makes one ask itself, then why was Saudi not forthcoming about its existence? Why the secrecy? This question is in the forefront of policymakers' minds. A week ago, a bipartisan group of congressional members sent a letter to the White House expressing concern about the Saudi collaboration with China on nuclear and missile programs and requesting detailed intelligence briefings on the extent of this collaboration. And fourth, the U.S. has previously expressed a willingness to support Saudi Arabia's desire for a civilian nuclear program. But Saudi has refused to abide by the gold standard, which is based on a parameter set by their neighbor, the UAE, and their nuclear program, and instead works with China. Let me end with this. Draft legislation earlier this month on the Hill called for competition and in some cases collaboration with China. It did not call for conflict with China. This should make Saudi Arabia stop with a, with a bit of relief. The whole but it should also inspire them to look closely at the draft legislation and think about how their China policy may need to be tweaked to avoid straining their relationship with the U.S. and which parts of their China policy might be leveraged to create the collaboration this legislation encourages, creating a win for everyone. So just very briefly, you don't object to Saudi trading with China, selling oil to China, but you would expect uh, as the prime uh, provider of security in the region for the rest remainder of the relationship to be quarantined uh, in many respects. Exactly, exactly. Um, and a little bit beyond that, there are things that would look like trade, uh, things like the Huawei issue and the like, that still pose a threat to U.S. national security interests in terms of allowing foreign access, for instance, to some of our you know newest technologies. So it's not simply all trade is fine, all, all security must be quarantined. It's anything that would impact the security of our systems and our interests should be considered. But on the, on the flip side, if you even if you're trading in terms of weapon systems with China, if there are things the US already understands or things that can be integrated into you know, a broader uh, network, 
if the need arose, that's okay too. So it's it's not it's not quite black and white, but the but it's very explicable and it's very logical. Um, Saudi Arabia cannot claim it doesn't understand those red lines. Okay, now Wu Bing Bing, I'll come to you uh, on that, but I'm going to go to Mohammed first. Mohammed, how, how what what is your response to that? That's a fairly tough-minded assessment or assertion of U.S continuing interests uh, in, in Saudi and in, and in the Gulf. Um, uh, is that a manageable request, if you like, from a Saudi perspective? Because as Jonathan said, your interests are also uh, growing and diversifying. Well, I mean, I think uh, the, uh, I mean, first of all, a Saudi perspective, this is my own sort of Certainly, individual yes, perspective yes. on the issue. Uh, I don't yes. represent necessarily yes. institutions or the state apparatus. Mm -hmm. But um, I should say that I think ultimately, from a Saudi vantage point, we're going to have to deal with the reality of sustained Sino-American tensions for at least a decade, if not more. Uh, I think there are a lot of structural causes for it. And we're already seeing a weaponization of different links primarily technological links at this point, Huawei, the use of Chinese equipments and different um, infrastructural networks. Um, and we're also potentially going to see maybe in the future a weaponization of financial links, right, with banking and SWIFT and the like. But this is, of course, this has also very serious implications for Saudi national security down the line. Um, but I think at the same time, listening to Christian, I think the, the issue at hand really is, and this is really why a lot of US allies are not really convinced by these arguments and these stark choices that are being presented to us, is that ultimately the US is not really providing alternatives, right? It, uh, there's a constant uh, criticism and attack on the use of Chinese equipment, of the use of Chinese technologies, but there is no real alternative being presented in terms of the provision of such technologies uh, for allies or even privileges for allies as such. Uh, you know, I think at the end of the day, we're a sovereign state. We have our national security considerations to take in mind. And historically, we have turned to other actors in pursuit and in defense in, in, in order to safeguard that national security. So in the 1950s, we've entered into dialogue with the Soviet Union, potentially for arms sales. The 1980s, Dongfang missiles sales that took place and which paved the way for the normalization of Sino-Saudi relations was also catalyzed by similar assessments. Um, so I think these, the, the needs and national security considerations of partners have to be taken into mind if the US wants to present a much more persuasive argument with regards to not using Chinese equipment. Now, certainly, I think for some partners or US partners in the region, such as Israel, they've already acceded to these requests. For example, joining the State Department's clean network program. But I think, of course, the calculations are very different. I mean, at the end of the day, Israel has a much more robust technological base. There's a lot greater concern about the dual use of technologies. And this has also been a pattern where the US has intervened and vetoed Israeli technology sales and military sales to China throughout the 20 uh, past years. This is not the case in Saudi Arabia, right? But uh, I think this is something that needs to be taken into consideration. Uh, ultimately, it is not useful for the United States to provide its partners uh, with these stark binary choices. You know, the US has to create a much more robust option for us to also safeguard our interests, whether in terms of development or national security. Okay, a brief follow-up. What about the relations with China itself? Um, you know, Xi Jinping came to Saudi, I think, in 2016, as uh, detailed by Jonathan's paper. What level of trust, knowledge, understanding has been built up between Saudi and China? I mean, have you do you have the ability to manage a relationship of this dimensions? Well, I think both sides have tried to build a lot of different institutional mechanisms to mediate relations. And there is, of course, also a developing familiarity at the level of elites on both sides. And I think when you look at, for example, Jonathan's report, he really highlights a, an important, interesting point, which is that the value gap between, for example, Saudi Arabia and China is far narrower than the one that exists between Saudi Arabia and the United States. Having said that, however, um, 
I think at the end of the day, the bottom lines of national security considerations of Saudi elites and Chinese elites is quite different and irreconcilable. For example, I don't really anticipate um, a scenario where China, for example, would uh, be willing to safeguard the regime security of the Gulf states, for instance. Uh, so this creates a barrier, right? And of course, it's also complicated by other ancillary factors, which is the, the nature of the Chinese political system as a Leninist uh, one-party state doesn't really create, for example, pathways for enhanced familiarization or lobbying, for example, as is the case in Washington. Uh, and certainly Saudi elites, even though they've invested heavily into sending people to go and obtain scholarships uh, in China, uh, aren't people who are necessarily going to be part of the upper elite strata and decision makers. So there is still a very big gap in terms of familiarization and really reaching a point where they can actually translate that into something more substantive strategically. So in some ways, I think uh, American apprehensions about Sino-Saudi relations are quite exaggerated. I think the debate itself at the current moment with regards to the China threat uh, in the United States particularly is uh, quite intense. There's a lot of issues and points of contestation that, uh, and that, that should be rightly voiced. But I think at this current moment, the these exaggerated fears are also projected onto the sign of Saudi relationship and China's bilateral relationship with many other actors. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, being, being let, let me bring you in at this point. Uh, as Jonathan's report details, the relationship is uh, has blossomed uh, in terms of trade, particularly the energy trade. The Belt and Road Initiative has now also um, resulted in a lot of infrastructure work. China, of course, is increasingly a, a tech power as well. Hence, we're talking about Huawei. How do you see the relationship developing? Uh, uh, in other words, would China eventually have a security dimension to its relationship with Saudi Arabia? Uh, and do you see the, the US inhibiting your ability to build a tighter relationship with Saudi Arabia? Uh, uh, first point I want to mention is that uh, uh, Jonathan's report has mentioned all the good times between China and Saudi Arabia since 2015, uh, after uh, King Salman became the king. China-Saudi relations has reached a very high level. Uh, many signal as uh, symbols and signals, you know, Jonathan mentioned. And another period of good time was uh, 2005 to 2010, uh, when King Abdullah was the, uh, the king. But there are also uh, bad times or cool times or difficult times. Uh, for example, you know, between uh, 2010 and to 2015, you know, the Arab Spring, and also uh, uh, in the early 1990s. So for Saudi Arabia, there is always an uh, angle of uh, regional geopolitical and global geopolitical consideration to develop relations with China. Uh, so, you know, I mean, for Saudi Arabia, they want to balance US and also to push China doesn't mix, mix, uh, take side uh, with Iran or Iraq. But from Chinese side, you know, China always wants to develop a very strong relations with Saudi Arabia uh, because of energy, because of trade, and also because of uh, Saudi's global and regional influence. So there's an imbalance between the two parties. We never uh, consider you know, Saudi Arabia as a, a, a factor of, uh, from this angle of uh, geopolitical uh, uh, background in the region or globally. So second point, Iran. Uh, I think you know Saudi Arabia is always worried about you know China will support Iran more uh, to weaken Saudi Arabia. But I think Chinese idea is very clear. You know, China Iran uh, relations are uh, normal bilateral relations. Uh, doesn't targeting any third party, neither Saudi Arabia nor the other countries in the region nor you know the great powers. And also China always uh, you know I mean uh, support a peaceful and diplomatic solution of the regional problems and tensions. Uh, so for Saudi Arabia, you know, more focus on, uh, you know, dependence on itself, more focus on military uh, solutions, you know, more focus on re uh, regional uh, coalitions. So I think there's a difference. But China, you know, doesn't want to, you know, I mean, uh, uh, have any trouble uh, similar to, you know, I mean, China-Saudi differences over Syrian crisis. So still all, uh, because uh, although there's a difference, we still want to, uh, you know, develop strong Saudi uh, uh, China relations, but uh, Saudi Arabia should think about you know, how to play the leading role in the whole region. So they have to offer, you know, I mean, solutions of the regional problems 
and also to uh, build a strong uh, social economic system for itself. So I think you know, this is uh, the challenge to Saudi Arabia. Uh, you know, it's not a challenge to, uh, to China. And third point, the US role. I think uh, Saudi Arabia benefit from uh, Saudi-China relations in uh, five fields. The first is energy, long-term energy partnership, not only uh, traditional uh, energy, but also nuclear and renewable. And second, technology. Because China, you know, uh, always try to transfer technology, not just to sell, you know, the products. And third is in the regional issues, you know, China uh, uh, can be, you know, a, a, a positive role, you know, in the escalation of these uh, tensions in the region. And fourth is the diversification of the economic uh, structure of Saudi Arabia. For example, you know, the tourism or, you know, investment, you know, China can do a lot. And the last one is the global balance, as uh, many, you know, I mean, speakers have mentioned. In this regard, you know, Saudi Arabia has uh, faced uh, a weakened uh, relations with the U.S. and also there's uh, tensions between U.S. and China. So I think if U.S. really uh, push your Saudi Arabia to take side, this can create a big pressure on Saudi Arabia. So this is, doesn't help, you know, Saudi Arabia to diversify its economy. Uh, 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 only, you know, I mean, U.S. can offer, uh, like Mohammed uh, Sudeik mentioned, you know, better solutions. And this is not good for Saudi Arabia to, you know, handle the regional issues like in Yemen, the Gulf and also Red Sea, you know, I met him. So U.S. must, you know, also help Saudi Arabia to handle all of these regional problems. Uh, uh, for example, Saudi Qatar, you know, I mean, uh, yeah. uh, problem. Mm -hmm. And I think the last one is that uh, this doesn't help Saudi Arabia to, to play the leading role in the region uh, because, you know, this doesn't help Saudi Arabia in any dimension. So uh, U.S. must offer better solutions of the regional problems and offer an alternative of all the technology investment and all the all these you know dimensions i think thank you um, a, a, a quick follow-up on i mean look out five to ten years into the future the us of course has been the traditional military power the saudi is a big sorry china is a big importer of saudi energy the us in effect is the security guarantor of making sure that gets out without conflict in the longer term, is it inevitable that China would also play a security role uh, in the area? Uh, I don't think so, you know, because, you know, I mean, uh, uh, China is very cautious that there is no vacuum in the region, you know, even there's uh, no strong U.S. military presence in the future, but still there are regional countries, regional powers like Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Turkey, Israel, Iran, all these countries. So. Uh, I don't think China would, you know, um, play a strong military role or security role in this region. Uh, still, China pursue, you know, uh, a peaceful uh, solution through negotiation in this region over the issues. Okay, so Jonathan, we'll come back to you now. I think in your report, you talk about how U.S. policy is, quote unquote, internally conflicted uh, because of a desire to limit U.S. Sorry, Richard, I, I think uh, you froze for a second or I froze. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you froze, I think. Did you hear my question? No, I'm sorry, I didn't. That's right. It, the, the, your report says that U.S. policy is internally conflict, conflicted, that, that, that Washington um, you know, wants to limit the U.S. role uh, comparable to the past in the region, but also force its allies to make a choice between Washington and, uh, and Beijing. I mean, looking out how, and taking note of the discussion, spirited discussion we've had so far, how do you see that uh, playing out? Is it, is it predictable at all? Hmm. I don't think it is very predictable right now. I think that it's something that every side um, has, has wanted to manage as long as possible. Uh, I, I live in Abu Dhabi, and I think after Secretary Pompeo's trip to Jerusalem, I spoke with some, um, some folks here about their reaction to, to this, I guess, um, more as, as well as more of a approach. And almost 
to a person, everybody said, this is definitely not what we want. We don't want to be put in a position where we have to make a choice. Um, that there are certain things, as, as Mohammed and, and uh, Professor Ubo said, that there are certain things that the U.S. provides uh, extremely well, and there are other things that China's been, been providing very well. And I think the desire here is to continue to navigate that um, kind of precarious balance as long as they can. And we've seen for years, uh, you know, there, there was a, uh, an interview that President Obama gave to the New York Times way back, I believe, in 2014, where he criticized China for free riding. Um, you can see a lot of uh, the U.S. has long kind of derided China's approach to the region. Uh, but at the same time, you can see that when China does start to, to become deep, more deeply engaged, uh, then there's a, a, a response to that. So when China says, okay, we're going to start uh, building ports and we're going to start uh, engaging with these countries on, on things like uh, 5G networks and digital Silk Road and smart city tech, um, this also seems to be criticized by the U.S. So I think um, from the Chinese side, and obviously not Chinese or Chinese official, but you can see how there'd be some frustration saying, look, we're engaging in a way that's meant to minimize conflict with U.S. interests. Um, and then from the U.S. perspective, that's fine. Uh, as, as Kristen mentioned, that is, if it's largely economic, that's fine. But once the economic conditions start to bump up into um, critical infrastructure or tech or de defense industries, then it starts to create larger problems. So um, it's a very tough balance to, to, to manage. And I honestly don't know how it's going to work out. I think what a lot of folks in the region seem to be doing is waiting to see what happens in November, honestly, um, to see if, if a different administration might have a different response. I don't think that's to say that anybody thinks that uh, a Biden administration would look more favorably towards China. I think both parties have the same concerns, but I expect that they might approach it differently. Um, so uh, I, I think everybody's just kind of trying to wait and see at this point. Kirsten, I'll come back to you now. Um, you can reply to any of that. I mean, particularly Mohammed's point, I guess, about what he said was uh, exaggerated choices being forced on Saudi Arabia. But I also want to ask you how you think US interests in the region have changed. There's been an energy revolution in the US over the past 20 years. The US, I think, has become a net oil and gas exporter. Uh, China, at the same time, uh, China's reliance on energy imports uh, continues to explode. And that naturally affects uh, geopolitical calculations on both sides. So could I ask you to re respond to those points? Well, it's actually going to be interesting to watch in terms of what Jonathan said about November. Um, I, we don't expect to see from a Biden administration the same interest in protecting the U.S. Uh, energy industry. So that could also impact how the U.S. relates to Saudi and how the U.S. perceives Saudi's relationship on the energy spectrum with, with China. Um, right now, yes, that is less of a concern to the U.S. So then what is our compelling interest in maintaining security in the Straits of Hormuz, for instance? Um, but I think that will all, I think that will be revisited in November, regardless of who comes into power. But what, what won't change, what both administrations would look to assess is what is the return on investment that we're getting from our relationship with the Gulf if we're not seeing it re return to us in the form of protecting our national security interests while we are there with you. U.S. engagement in the Gulf is very expensive. Chinese engagement in the Gulf is very lucrative. And this is not a sustainable imbalance for the U.S. So right now, the U.S. understands that the cost of maintaining the role as the kingdom's strategic partner is providing security to the kingdom, you know, a level of, of support to security to the kingdom. But the kingdom is moving away from its role. Um, and then like, it's part of the deal, which is to make providing that security worth the US's while. So the US would expect preferential treatment in some cases where security and trade overlap in things like developing a civilian nuclear industry. Some of the cases where, where we would expect to see Saudi say, we understand your concerns, um, we don't see an immediate national security or human security imperative in necessarily building that sector or in making Niam a completely networked city. You know, we're willing to, to wait until some of the security questions have been addressed, but we're not seeing that. And that's what's causing the U.S. to question whether or not there's a commitment from the Saudi side. So you don't think the... Regardless of who's in the U.S. administration. 
Right. So inevitably, from the US perspective, Saudi will have to make choices on, uh, on, on many of these issues, the tech issues, the interface with security and the like. Saudi will have to make choices. But I think Saudi could also play a role in increasing US-Chinese collaboration on some of their overlapping interests in the Gulf. So things like securing the, the you know, the, the, the shipping lanes for trade and flow of energy, for things like counterterrorism, for things like counter narcotics, um, for the development of, of sort of human potential in the region. I think there are a lot of things the US and China could potentially collaborate on. We're not in that space right now, but perhaps Saudi and other Gulf neighbors could play a role in facilitating that discussion. Uh, Mohammed, uh, we'll go, come come back to you now. Um, <clears throat> now you're not, as you made clear at the start, we all know you're not a spokesperson for the Saudi government. Um, but but how do you think the 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 Saudi government sees its ability to negotiate uh, uh, these difficult issues between the U.S. and China? Of course, not just between the U.S. and China. Saudi has many other partners. Uh, Europe is important. Uh, Japan is competing with China around the world at, at the same time as well ha and has important energy interests. I mean, could Saudi conceive of China playing a greater security role in the region, even if perhaps China itself says uh, it won't do so for the moment? I think if we look at the statements made by uh, a whole gamut of Saudi officials and commentators over the past few years, um, I think the stance or the position that they voiced is, for example, with regards to our information minister, that Saudi already has its own internal mechanisms to do security checks about equipments and technologies and whatnot. And of course, Saudi is also in a process of upgrading its own cyber capacities, its own use of forefront technologies and the like. So I think we also have our own concerns about how do we safeguard these systems, right? So this notion that somehow we're going to allow for the use of equipment that would allow for backdoor mechanisms is also ludicrous uh, in some ways. Um, and I think also in terms of the rhetoric we see coming in from different commentators, even key ones who are, for example, close to position uh, in relation to decision makers, is the narrative that ultimately our most important partner, security-wise and in terms of the key political issues that interest us in the region, is the United States. China is a very close economic partner that we engage with, but ultimately we're not with them on the same page on a whole range of regional issues, which I think Dr. Wu could elaborate on, whether when it comes to Iran, for example, or Syria at different junctures of the civil war. So the picture is a lot more complicated, um, I would say, in responding to that. Let me ask you specifically about, about uh, Huawei, if I may. Um, uh, in the early stages when the US was asking many countries to reject Huawei, the US didn't seem to be doing very well. But if you look at the situation now, it seems very different. You know, you've got Australia, Japan, probably Canada, the UK, France, uh, maybe Italy, uh, Germany having a big day, debate, the Scandinavian countries, uh, Singapore, I think, in a tender. So it appears that the US campaign on Huawei, in fact, is bearing fruit. Um, uh, is that issue still in play in Saudi Arabia? I, of course, have no inkling about the sort of the inner workings and debates that are happening within, but I could say is that the responsiveness of a lot of these places to American pressures with regards to Huawei is that in a lot of these places, it's linked with a much wider societal debate about Chinese influence, whether in New Zealand, Australia, Singapore, or in the EU, right? Uh, in relation to industrial, as perceptions of industrial espionage, the use of academic institutions to do data collection um, and the like. So it's, it's more connected to wider national debates that are very much responsive to these pressures. This is not taking place in Saudi and in Saudi, it's not unique. Uh, I mean, if you look at many other developing contexts and other regions of the world beyond sort of the, the first world, quote unquote, these concerns are not there, or at least not as apparent and pronounced, right? Mm. Um, fa fair enough. Uh, Dr. Wu, I, I come back to you now. Um, uh, to, taking note of that, um, to what extent do you think uh, uh, China feels exposed to instability in the Middle East? I know that China has made great efforts to diversify its sources of energy. 
particularly with Russia, but also from um, LNG from countries like Australia. Uh, does 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 China feel exposed to instability in the Middle East, or do you think the diversification of your sources of energy is sufficient? Uh, I think uh, China really, you know, tried uh, for a long time to diversify the source of energy uh, from uh, Central Asia, from Russia, from Africa, from uh, Pacific. Now, uh, based on the first phase of uh, trade agreement, China uh, start to buy more and more uh, energy from the U.S. also. Uh, but, uh, you know, China is a, a large consumer of uh, energy, you know. Uh, I think you know, we should uh, buy from uh, every region. So Middle East is always uh, the most important region. Uh, and not only trade, but you know, I mean, Chinese companies like CNPC, CNOPEC, and CNOC are participating in many programs and projects of uh, energy development in uh, Iraq, uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and uh, other Middle East countries. So it's not only trade, you know, it's also the whole sector. Uh, in this regard, I think Middle East is always, you know, I mean, occupy a very important uh, uh, role, you know, in Chinese uh, energy sector. And not only traditional uh, energy, as I mentioned, also uh, the renewable, like solar, uh, like, you know, the other forms of, you know, energy. So, I mean, Jonathan mentioned one plus two plus three. So, I mean, uh, energy has been mentioned, you know, many times in this regard. What about Jonathan's other point, though? Um, you know, China is an emerging superpower, even though it doesn't always like to admit that. Uh, Jonathan makes the point in his report that China at the moment has a policy of being friends to everybody. Uh, you've talked a little bit about uh, the relationship with Iran, China-Iran, which people are watching very closely at the moment. Is it really sustainable, honestly, to main, be friends with everybody? Don't you have to make choices, hard choices, um, about who you'll be most friendly with, uh, particularly in an uh, area like the Middle East? How, how is China preparing for that? Uh, let's take the example of Saudi, you know, Iran uh, competition in the region. Uh, we think there's no winner, you know, in this competition. You know, uh, both countries could be exhausted. And the thing about Yemen has been a bleeding wound for Saudi Arabia. And Syria also, you know, to Iran the same, maybe. And also we see more tensions in uh, Lebanon, uh, Iraq, Libya. Uh, so this means that, you know, I mean, uh, no country can win uh, in this geopolitical and geo uh, strategic competitions. So there must be a platform for countries to sit down to talk, find a solution. So that's why uh, China wants to develop relations with everyone, do not take side, but we support efforts to have a regional uh, platform for uh, talks and corporations. I think that could be one, uh, one way uh, leading to the solution. Do you see any Chinese initiatives on the horizon? Uh, I think, you know, I mean, uh, the, the, this kind of initiative must come from the regional countries themselves, not from any other powers. And other powers can only uh, facilitate and help. So we always take the example of ASEAN countries, you know, in 1950s and 60s, there were even more tensions. And culturally, there are even more diversified. But uh, look at you know, ASEAN now. But, you know, Singapore and some other countries play the, the role of, uh, you know, offering this initiative. So that's why we cannot impose. We can only facilitate and support. Thank you. Jonathan, I'll come back to you now. Um, it's impossible to have this discussion without mentioning uh, Xinjiang. Um, as you say in your report and as you said in your opening, Saudi takes its uh, role as the sort of leader of Islam very seriously. Uh, many Western countries, I should say, have been critical of the uh, re-education camps in Xinjiang. The US has sanctioned some Chinese officials, but Western countries have also complained that Islamic countries have largely remained silent. Um, uh, why do you think that is? And is this a subject of great debate within Saudi Arabia itself? Well, uh, not being in Saudi, um, I can't really comment on whether it's a, a, a topic of gr uh, great debate there. Um, I teach Emirati University students, and I've talked about it quite often with my students. And overwhelmingly, um, what I find is it's, first of all, it's not really on many people's radars. It's not an issue that a whole lot of folks know much about. Um, it's not particularly surprising, but because in the Gulf, most of the media is state owned. Um, and this is something that doesn't really 
get a lot of traction. Um, I think there's some reasons for this, but I'm, I'm you know, again, uh, being neither uh, Muslim nor, nor Arab, I'm maybe not the best representative, but it's also maybe safer for me to talk about it. I think one issue that resonates, um, and this goes back to the values gap, is that Chinese leaders describe Xinjiang um, quite consistently as a response to uh, political ideology that threatens the state. Um, that is something that, that resonates very deeply here. You can see, for example, in the UAE, the Muslim Brotherhood is considered probably a, a, a bigger threat than Iran, for example. And when Chinese leaders say, look, this is what we're doing to combat political Islam, uh, I think that that gains traction with a lot of leaders. Um, I think that's probably the biggest issue is that that the way China has, has been able to frame this has been quite um, successfully uh, accepted by, by leaders in the Middle East. Uh, another issue when you look at it, um, and this is speculation uh, purely, but um, the Uyghurs are Turkic people and Turkey and the Saudis and the Emiratis have a lot of issues that they don't agree on very much. And I think that there's, there does seem to be a sense that maybe this is more of Turkey's problem than it is an Arab problem. So um, I think because there seems to be a bit of an ideological and hard power competition between Turkey and other Sunni powers in the Middle East, then this doesn't really um, generate as much interest. But again, coming back to the, the elite level um, component of it, I think the fact that um, a lot of leaders in Middle Eastern countries look at China as uh, an important partner, especially in a post-COVID era, um, in terms of development assistance, in terms of trade, in terms of development, um, it doesn't seem to be beneficial to, to antagonize Beijing on this issue, especially when it's not something that seems to, to uh, cost them much politically. Um, I also think that China's uh, principle of non-interference and, and other countries' domestic affairs codified in the, the five principles of peaceful coexistence, uh, I think that also goes a long way. You can see, for example, that when China works with countries in the region, uh, there are very few um, expectations in terms of domestic uh, political expectations or normative expectations. Uh, uh, the flip side of that, of course, is Western countries, Western powers will come in and say, we want to see more democracy, uh, more open media, we want elections, human rights. So it seems to be something where there's maybe a bit of a trade-off. If, if you're going to not push us on, on our domestic problems, then we're not going to address you on, on yours as well. Um, Kirsten and Mohammed. Uh, respectively, do you have anything to say on that issue and, and, and uh, how, how the US is pushing Saudi on this issue? Yeah. To you first, Kirsten. Sure. You know, there is an irony in the fact that the US is more vocally opposed to what we're seeing in Xinjiang than um, other Muslim nations. But in 2018, the US government conducted a review of state owned media in Saudi Arabia and some other states on coverage of what was happening in Xinjiang to look at um, how they were portraying this to their population and how seriously they were considering this a, you know, something that they should be involved in. And we found very, very little, almost no coverage of it. And when it was discussed, it was certainly only as a CT problem. And the basis for the CT argument we were receiving from China was never questioned. It was confirmed in most of the media coverage that was coming out then. And what that told us at the time was that Saudi Arabia was very likely concerned that if the population knew details about what was happening in Xinjiang, they would be upset about Saudi Arabia's strengthening relationship with China at the time. And so the, the leadership chose to keep this issue off of their radar and minimize their familiarity with the details from the ground. Mohammed, do you have any comment on that issue? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, it's a very complicated uh, issue and very multifaceted. I think when we look at, for example, popular sentiment, even anecdotally, I think the landscape is quite complicated. I mean, there's a lot of certainly ignorance about it, but there's also a lot of discussions and conversations happening uh, on social media, on different platforms, on this issue. Um, so I think the picture is quite complicated and it would require much more in-depth survey that really looks and gauges how the public thinks about this issue. At the elite level, I have to agree with Jonathan. I think um, 
what Gulf elites, but also Chinese elites, and even in the broader Eurasian region, accept is sort of this notion of a more Westphalianized Islam. Uh, that is to say, they're all very wary of transnational ties between Muslim groups uh, of a political, but also of a religious character. And I think this is very much a legacy of the Arab Spring, where you know the experiences over the last nine years have exhausted the elites as well as the societies to a certain extent and have made them very suspicious about narratives of transnational Muslim solidarity. So, for example, uh, with respect to Xinjiang, we see a very similar debate unfolding with regards to the Rohingya in Myanmar, right? So we have to take in the local aspects of how people are thinking about these issues into consideration. And I think also the other aspect to it is I think for a lot of people watching from the region and elsewhere in the Muslim world who look at U.S. efforts to raise concern about this issue, uh, they look at it with considerable suspicion, obviously, because if you look at U.S. foreign policy over the last two decades, right, the invasion of Afghanistan, the invasion of Iraq, this raises a lot of skepticism about the nature of these claims, right, which may stand if someone has access, of course, to Chinese sources and looks at the evidence available, which is really not the case with the majority of people and onlookers. But what they do emphasize is looking at the messenger and the messenger has very questionable credibility. Okay, Dr. Wu, do you have any comment on the Xinjiang issue at all? Uh, I agree with the, the analysis. I think for China, you know, Xinjiang issue is a domestic affair. The other countries shouldn't interfere. Like China, you know, doesn't interfere in the affairs of the Middle Eastern countries. And also, it's mainly a counterterrorism uh, measure, you know, I think uh, uh, the other speakers have explained this very clear. Okay, so now I'm going to move to questions uh, from the audience. Uh, the first one, from Chris Blanchard at the US Congressional Research Service. He talks about a recent article in Tablet Magazine, which says that China is advancing on the Middle East with quote unquote, ruthless determination. And it warns of a Chinese Russian condominium in the Middle East to undermine the US interests. And he compares this to the Atlantic Council argument, uh, sorry, the reports argument that China appears to be to content to nibble at the edges while the US remains the kingdom's security partner of choice. Jonathan, would you care to comment, first of all, on that contrast in perceptions of China in the Middle East? Sure. Uh, I think far too much is made of this notion of uh, China-Russia um, alliance to undermine you know, the, the status quo in, in the Middle East and around the world. I think really, if we look more carefully, we see that China and Russia really cooperate a whole lot less than, than they're given credit for. Um, in the Middle East, we've seen in the Gulf, I guess, especially, uh, there was a, a joint naval exercise between Iran, Russia, and China. And it seemed to draw a lot of uh, notice and a lot of fear, the sense of a, an axis of revisionists that was going to up in this, the, the, the regional order. Um, I, again, I, I, I've written about this a lot. I think it's quite overblown. If you look at what China's been doing in the Middle East and the countries it's been partnering with and, and investing the most money where it has the deepest expatriate populations, where it does the most trade, all these countries are U.S. partners and allies. Uh, the countries that threaten America's interests in the Middle East are the ones where China's footprint is very, very shallow. So I, I really think, I understand why it gets a lot of press because it is a pretty sexy story, but I really just don't, I don't buy into it. I think what China has been doing is, is working and, and maybe nibbling at the edge just sounds a little glib, but China's been, as, as many other ex, extra regional powers have been doing, has been working under this US umbrella and taking advantage, advantage of the relative stability that it provides. And of course, stability in the Middle East is always a very relative term, but China's not operating to upend anything. It's, it's working within this framework that the US has made. And I think, uh, I think you know, Professor Wu could talk much more eloquently than I about this, but I think the idea of China wanting to, um, to, to challenge U.S. primacy or, or U.S. interests uh, really to me seems to be not supported by the data. You know, what China seems to be doing is working very closely within this U.S. framework. 
And, and as Professor Wu said, there's not really an appetite in China to replace the U.S. Why would they want to take on this, um, this incredible uh, and, and frankly uh, unreasonable role? So, and, and to, to do this by working with Russia, a country in which China has historically had very bad relations, uh, really seems to me uh, quite exaggerated. Kirsten, what do you think? China-Russia condominium? The China-Russia relation these days is getting a lot of renewed interest and in study. Is it a serious platform in the Middle East? I think it's more of an issue of the whole being greater than the sum of its parts. You know, two independent strategies on the part of Russia and China having compounding impact on the U.S. side. So we do see both of them having what we, we feel very strongly are strategies to undermine U.S. global power uh, in, in that extends to things like weapon sales and their cyber activities and election meddling. Both of them are involved in very similar activities. But I haven't personally, having not read the intel in a while, I haven't personally seen what I would consider a, a, a synchronized, coordinated strategy between the two to do that. Okay. Um, the next question, which I'll take to Muhammad and uh, uh, Wu Bingbing, is from the uh, uh, Chang Wang, at the uh, director of the Ministry of Commerce in China. With reference to the strategic partnership between China and the UAE, seemingly more comprehensive than the one between China and Saudi Arabia, is there any negative impact of this on Sino-Saudi relations? Mohammed. I mean, of course, I, I cannot really answer this in as granular a fashion as I would like. Maybe perhaps you would want to address it to Jonathan as well. But I have never really encountered any assessments, whether from Saudi open sources or closed sources, that view um, the strategic partnership between China and the UAE with any degree of apprehension. Um, I mean, in many ways, actually, these strategic partnerships <laughs> retain a very high degree of uh, ambiguity uh, in terms of their content. And one can place under their umbrella a whole range of things. And it's really much dependent on the institutions bilaterally and the actors bilaterally, with, um, what they do with regards to realizing the strategic partnership. Um, so yes, I haven't encountered any apprehensions that might be there, but not certainly anything that I've encountered. Uh, Dr. Wu, do you think, uh, what, what's, your, what's your view on this issue? Uh, as I mentioned that, you know, China developed relations with uh, different countries based on you know, bilateral uh, uh, foundation, you know, not uh, targeting any third country. So uh, UAE, you know, has Dubai as a financial center in the whole region and Abu Dhabi as a center for, you know, I mean, uh, energy. So I think, you know, this uh, it's, uh, and also China, you know, has uh, a cooperation, you know, between uh, CNPC and uh, ADNOC, you know. I mean, uh, and also uh, Chinese company Sandopak has a strong relation with uh, Aramco. So you see, they're different, you know, I mean, things, but uh, they are not contradictory to each other. Different channels and different tracks. J Jonathan, what, do you have a, an opinion on that? Is that an important issue? Uh, I think I, I agree with uh, Mohammed and Dr. Wu on this one. I think they've covered it pretty well. Okay. The, the, a number of uh, 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 people watching have asked a question about the Sino-Saudi cooperation in nuclear facilities. Um, Saudi seems to have chosen to cooperate with China on aspects relating to uranium, keeping future enrichment options open. The US has made it clear this would not be supported, so the pivot to China seems natural from a Saudi perspective. Where is the US on the enrichment issue at the moment? Can you also address the US perspective and also the Israeli perspective on this? Kirsten, I might put that one to you. In 2018, we had a conversation with Saudi Arabia about their desire to establish civilian nuclear industry and said from the, you know, this particular administration, yes, there's support for that idea. We want it to be modeled after the UAE's gold standard. Um, we would probably have trouble getting this passed through Congress at a time when Saudi was making a series of pretty unwise decisions in their own policies. Um, so Saudi Arabia, could you please just put this on hold? If you don't need it right away, could you ice this for a year? Allow the U.S. to improve our own bid because at the time, the U.S. government or the U.S. Um, bid to support that industry in Saudi Arabia was not strong. 
Um, because of U.S. regulations about safety at such facilities, there were a lot of additional hoops to jump through than Saudi would have had the, uh, working with Chinese, French, or South Korean opportunities at the time. So the U.S. government said, please put this on ice. We'll revisit it in a year or so. You don't have the money to pay for it right now, Saudi, anyway. This looks like a vanity project. Let's talk later after the U.S. has had a chance to, to improve our bid, because we do expect, as your strategic partner, that something this significant and with overlapping security ramifications would be something you would choose to partner with us on. Um, that stayed on ice for a, for a while, but you know um, Saudi had pre-existing uh, nuclear exploration agreements with China and signed in 2012, 2017, that they essentially began implementing behind closed doors. Uh, and, and that was the concern. And it, it remains, as I mentioned previously, you know, even Congress is sending requests to the White House for detailed intelligence briefings. There's a lot of concern about the nature of this collaboration since it was pursued behind the backs, in essence, um, and since there has not been a revisiting of the conversation with the U.S. about the U.S.'s own bid, and since Saudi continues to push off the gold standard requirements, which everyone seems to agree with. The Emiratis have, had, have been a wonderful model of it. Um, you know, why is Saudi not comfortable with it? That also raises questions about the intent. Okay, do any other of the panelists have a view on that, which uh, um, supports or disagrees with Kirsten's? No, no volunteers. Okay, here's a good question from, which I should have thought of myself, from Dan Markey at John Hopkins. Um, how has Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's leadership affected the trajectory of China-Saudi relations? Most of the conversation has been termed, framed in terms of structural forces and state interests, less so in terms of leadership and decision-making. <clears throat> if so much depends on Saudi's ability to thread the needle between China and the United States, how do panelists assess his ability to manage that feat? Uh, let's start with you, Jonathan. Yeah, there's a reason for that, and I guess it's because as a political scientist, I'm really more comfortable with the bigger structural framing of it because we so rarely know um, how to weigh, how to measure or weigh those those leadership variables or those personal variables. I mean, I you did you did you did talk in your report, of course, about the the impact of uh, of the Khashoggi murder, though, and uh, and how that affected how MBS behaved. His, di his diplomacy turning to China, anger at the U.S. and the like. Right. Well, I think that that I, I think you're right. That obviously that does did have have an impact in how he saw his his relationships with other countries' leaders. Um, you know, I, I think I framed it in the report that it was shortly before that murder that he had been treated essentially like a rock star in his tour of the U.S. You know, he's partying with Dwayne Johnson and he's talking with his friend Tom Hanks. And to, to have that very uh, grand reception and then to see how quickly um, the public perception turned. And you had you know, Lindsey Graham, who has always been quite a supporter of Saudi, uh, suddenly saying, we're going to sanction the hell out of them. Donald Trump uh, swinging from, from one extreme to the other. Uh, I think it probably created a sense that, that the U.S. Um, maybe was less reliable uh, on this. How that shapes Chinese perceptions, I mean, I wouldn't know. I, I think from what I've seen, the China-UAE relationship, and maybe this is because I live in Abu Dhabi, but what I see is that the UAE is uh, probably a more mature, more well-rounded relationship. It seems to meet a wider range of interests, and I think there seems to be a greater degree of comfort in operating in the UAE for Chinese businesses and Chinese political leaders. Uh, there seems to be a sense that the UAE maybe is a little more stable or maybe a little more easy to navigate than, than Saudi is. What you see is that a lot of Chinese companies have their uh, regional headquarters in Jebel, uh, Jebel Ali's free zone, Jafsa, um, and they're tendering their contract to Saudi. Uh, I think when, when Mohammed bin Salman started to talk about the reforms uh, associated with Saudi Vision 2030 and, and his uh, promotion of a more moderate, Saudi and a more modern Saudi, I think that resonated. But then I think that certain acts after that, uh, which Kristen kind of uh, alluded to, um, maybe caused certain external countries uh, to pause and think, let's wait and see how this plays out. When Saudi Vision 2030 requires so much uh, external FDI, 
and then you see your country's biggest venture capitalists or, or, or wealthiest citizens um, being uh, compelled to surrender some of the wealth from a hotel room, it might have given people uh, you know, concerns about the, how uh, stable a place it is for them to invest. But again, that's it's hard to say. Muhammad, do you have any uh, any comment on, on this issue? Well, I think, um, I mean, I tend to be more structuralist, really. But even if we look at him um, as an actor in Sino-Saudi uh, relations, I think one could make a very good argument to say that he represented the second eastward policy towards China, or the second iteration of an eastward Saudi policy towards China. Because if you think about the reign of King Abdullah, who descended the throne in 2015 and passed away in 2015, there was something of um, a drift in Sino-Saudi relations from around 2011 to 2014. And a lot of this was driven by differences, particularly over Syria, but also a range of other issues related to the negotiation of a free trade agreement at the GCC level and so forth. And in what really restarted the relationship was the visit by then Crown Prince Salman to Beijing in 2014, and accompanying him was uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salman. And actually, uh, it's interesting really that that constituted the reset because it was really that year that also coincided with the collapse of uh, oil prices after sort of a very long sustained boom for over a decade. So what we really saw in the last sort of six years or so in which Jonathan's report talks about amply is really the development of new institutional mechanisms to routinize engagement between elites, you know, the, the joint uh, high committee, for example, um, the development of uh, more joint projects, particularly in relation to energy security. But there is, I think you could make an argument that China has gained greater importance as part of a continuing trend in Saudi policy. And I think in some ways, even at a personalized level, um, I think the Saudi leadership has really appreciated, for example, some of the political gestures made by Beijing over the last few years, particularly, for example, when it came to the international fallout with respect to uh, the Khashoggi case. And I think, you know, Chinese uh, iteration of political support, followed by, for example, the dispatch of a delegation to the investment conference that was held in Riyadh and which was abandoned by a lot of Western partners, are all really part of this larger story. Hmm. And Kirsten, do you have any comment on that? I hope you're not going to say you're a structuralist as well. No, in fact, in, in countries with such highly centralized decision-making structures, I tend to be much more sort of personality, uh, base than, than structuralists. And I would say that based on empirical evidence about what we've known about the crown prince, I would expect that he believes he can manage this, this relationship, that he can manage China. You know, he's, he's not concerned about backdoors into China, into Saudi technology because they can manage it, which, you know, um, I think might even be disrespecting Chinese technologists. We saw in 2016, for instance, Mohammed bin Salman at the time told our ambassador in Riyadh when the issue of, of a resurgent Russia was raised. Um, oh, I can handle Putin, you know, and that really sent up alarm bells around the U.S. government. Kind of went, whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, no, you can't. You know, n almost nobody can, um, and it, and that was a little bit concerning. Um, but I think that that a lot of what we're seeing now isn't necessarily a, a negative. I think this drive to do quite a bit of what he's doing with China is actually um, driven by his desire to really change things quickly and his desire to meet a lot of the Vision 2030 goals. So I don't think there I don't think there's anything um, nefarious behind a lot of the relationship. I, I do think he's he's pursuing it for for well-intended reasons on many many levels. Um, but it perhaps is a bit naive of any leader around the world to think that they can manage um, great power competition uh, themselves. Uh, Doctor Wu, I want to ask you the same question, but in a slightly different fashion. Certainly many uh, developing countries have welcomed Chinese investment um, compared to, say, multilateral institutions, uh, the, the, the policy of non-interference, so-called, uh, no strings attached investment. Um, you know, you do not um, talk to other countries about their human rights situation and the like. In that context, uh, uh, has the elevation of the crown prince in Saudi Arabia helped 
solidify Sino-Saudi relations? Uh, I think you know, I have to mention structural factors, you know, uh, <laughs> because as a person, a person, you know, I mean, uh, King Abdullah uh, is very friendly to China, was very friendly to China, but because of Syria, Syria he had no option but to, you know, uh, degrade China-Saudi relations. Uh, so this is very clear that you know, it's not either this person is friendly or hostile to us. It is because, you know, there's a background, you know, either it's a strategic or it's, you know, other things. Like, you know, okay, you know, I mean, uh, King uh, Salman and uh, Crown Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman want to strengthen relations with China. Okay, but I, as I mentioned, you know, technology, including AI, 5G, defense technology, medical technology, we can offer. If we cannot offer, you know, for Niam City or, you know, I mean, uh, Aramco, you know, I mean, uh, these petrochemical uh, projects, we cannot have cooperation. So it means that we just, you know, I mean, meet the demand of the Saudi Arabia currently. So Saudi Arabia can develop that relation with us. If, you know, we go back, uh, you know, 30 years ago, even Saudi Arabia had the same leadership. They didn't want to have this kind of relationship with us. We didn't talk about AI 30 years ago from China, right? So that's why I say, you know, Saudi Arabia benefit from this relationship. That's uh, the most important factor. Um, yes, um, I don't think we talked about AI from the US 30 years ago either, but certainly China is right up there on that issue. Uh, the fifth, next question from Adele uh, Hamizia, I hope I haven't mispronounced that, from Chatham House. Do any of you um, have any comments about the prospects for increasing use of the yuan or the renminbi in financial markets, but I guess particularly in terms of trade settlement? One of the big issues in US-China competition at the moment, one of China's big fears, this is pretty open, is the weaponization of the dollar mm. and its use against China. And there's been various attempts, particularly by Russia, to wean itself off use of the dollar. Um, it, do we see in the Middle East, in the uh, energy trade, the oil trade, uh, pressure requests from China for the trade to be conducted in renminbi and how open is Saudi to that? Uh, Jonathan, do you have anything to say on that? I knew Adel would ask that question. He always gets me with that question and I'm never able to answer him because I know very little about currency. But um, I mean, obviously there's been talk about uh, the petro yuan for years. I, I don't think it's a real thing. Um, China has, has got some uh, swap agreements with the UAE, with Qatar, uh, that have been used to either facilitate trade or to, to pay contracting for different projects in the region. Um, These have moved a lot of money, but I think, uh, again, uh, I don't think there's any movement towards anything that's going to challenge outright the US. Uh, it just doesn't seem to be worth the, um, the, the cost of it. But I'm sure uh, either Yimbin uh, or Mohammed would have more, more on this than me. Yes, Mohammed or uh, Kirsten, do you have any comment on that issue? Not no Kirsten, no Mohammed. Um, I think, I mean, if you look at the existing data, the internationalization of the RMB still is quite low. But I think the experiences with the trade war and sort of the changing discourse in the West is probably going to intensify efforts in China to invest into developing alternative systems that are not vulnerable to these pressures. And we're already seeing it in terms of like the digital currency campaign and the attempt to build sort of an alternative to SWIFT. Um, however, I think for the short term, countries like Saudi Arabia will resist the usage of the renminbi, for example, for oil sales. At least I know this is the position that officials have expressed over the past few years. I don't know what's the current uh, attitude about it, but there is an insistence on uh, being paid with the dollar, uh, which of course is uh, pegged to the Saudi real. So there would be there would have there would be very serious ramifications internally for Saudi if there was a change in this policy. Now, of course, I think long term, however. All of these developments, the weaponization of technology links, the financial links, is really raising the prospect of a very segmentalized global economic order where different technology standards are in place and very different financial standards are in place. And sort of these very self-enclosed systems that might potentially be reinforced also by the changes that will be brought about by the fourth industrial revolution in terms of shortening supply chains and centraling industry. And it's not very clear to me whether policymakers in the Gulf 
and even in other places around the world that are not necessarily part of the industrial core represented by East Asia or North America and Europe have really had sufficient discussions about how to prepare for these and what contingencies we might need to pursue in order to protect our own national interests. Okay, Dr. Wu, do you have any do you have any comment on this? Is this issue uh, you you move in Middle East policy circles in China? Is there increasing discussion of trying to trade with uh, uh, Arab countries, um, energy uh, exporters in renminbi instead of the dollar? Uh, I don't think China intentionally uh, want to do that unless there's a huge pressure from the U.S. As you know, the question mentioned to weaponize U.S. dollar to pressure on China. So currently you look at uh, the case of Iran, you know, to establish an alternative payment channel is so difficult. Even the European countries use the, you know, I mean, uh, uh, the, the new mechanism, but it doesn't work very well. So I don't think, you know, uh, China should do that intentionally, but I don't know, you know how US would pressure China on this way. Yes, that all lies ahead of us. Um, we haven't got too much more time. Uh, we've got one more question, time for one more question, I think. And uh, well, I haven't got a name for this question, but they wanted to revisit the question of China's relationship with Saudi Arabia on the one hand and Iran on the other. How does China's relationship with Iran impact Saudi's calculation of its national interests? Jonathan, I'll start with you. Okay, well, this is one that obviously comes up a lot because China, again, the idea that they can be friends to everybody uh, is something that very few people find credible. And I think uh, a reason for that is because we haven't seen too many powers that have managed it uh, in the past 40 years. Uh, I think I think this is the privilege on the one hand of being at that second tier of regional powers. You know, uh, the U.S. has an alliance system which forced, has forced it to take sides. Uh, China has, has had a strict non-alliance policy since 1982. It instead uses these uh, comprehensive partnerships, uh, strategic partnerships rather, and uh, as, as uh, a couple of people have referred to already today, that they're quite ambiguous, they're quite vaguely articulated, and let's try to get away with quite a bit. So, and how it pursues relations with, with Iran and Saudi, um, I don't think that it's neutral by any stretch. I think if you look at the data, you'll see that its interests lie much more closely with, with the Saudis than it does with the Iranians. Um, Saudi also comes with the benefit of having the other GCC countries, which also have substantial trade and investment with China. And taken as a group, they dwarf uh, China's economic relations with, with Iran. Again, if you look at the BRI, this is all about connectivity. Uh, Saudi is connected to all the countries on the Arabian Peninsula, I guess with uh, the exception of Yemen and uh, Qatar uh, in recent years. But it's also connected to other status quo countries around the Middle East. Iran is uh, alone. It's not connected really to, uh, to anybody in the region. It doesn't offer the same type of benefits. So um, China, I think the idea that China is going to privilege Iran over Saudi to me is really uh, exaggerated. And I think what's happened in this case, what they've consistently done, offer positive inducements, offer incentives. <coughs> UAE has done a lot more successfully, I think, with all the free trade zones and, and uh, you know, all the investment opportunities. But um, it really does does create a, a, a situation where it's weighted much more favorably on the Saudi side than the Iranian one. Mohammed? I mean, I largely agree with Jonathan's analysis, although maybe I would add something which, in my way, it, my opinion highlights some of the problems that China will come to increasingly face in the region as a whole, which is that if you look at the coverage that had erupted across the region, both within Iran and elsewhere, about the, the, the treaty that was supposedly signed or is it going to be signed between China and Iran, the 25 year one, there was a, really a great amount of exaggeration that was weaved around it, including the deployment of military, Chinese military assets and even sort of a territorial arrangement where an island would be ceded. And it's a very interesting, and sort of also money, so around 400 billion US dollars worth of capital would be invested into Iran over the span of two decades. I don't know where anyone would get such money. 
But what's interesting that the same narrative was generated around Kuwait two years ago. Um, you know, social media, public discussions were revolved around that Kuwait was going to cede an island for the Chinese, uh, the plan, the People's Liberation Army Navy, uh, and it's for its use for an extraterritorial um, right of 99 years, echoing that of Hong Kong, that they would bring something to the tune of half a trillion US dollars. Of course, this is all nonsense, but I think it highlights sort of this emerging zeitgeist in the region where China is really being imagined seriously as a great power, right? And one that can really alter the security and economic configurations of the region in substantive ways. Of course, this is quite distant from the realities on the ground and sort of what actually are the foreign policy assessments of Chinese elites. But it's you know sort of one aspect to take into consideration when thinking about this issue. Kirsten, do you have any views on that? Sadly, as you said before, you don't have access to the intel anymore. You might be able to tell us whether an agreement has been signed. I've read about it so often I'm now confused myself. But, but what's your view on that is on that point? I think I think instead of saying China is friend to all, perhaps they should just say China is trading partner to all, which would be accurate and admirable in itself. But you know, if I'm Saudi Arabia and I'm looking at whether or not China is my friend or Iran's friend, I'm looking at the UN arms embargo on Iran's uh, weapon sales. And I'm looking at the fact that China is not going to allow for that arms embargo to be extended. You know, Both China and Russia, again, perhaps not coordinated, but both with the desire to sell weapons to Iran um, in a business relationship are telling Saudi, mm, no, we're, we're not going to, to weigh in in your favor in the UN when you and your Gulf state neighbors have written a letter to the UN specifically stating that you believe that an up-armed Iran presents an existential threat to the region. So China knows how where Saudi stands on that and China still says, we're gonna side with our business partner. You know, And I believe China would do the same thing if the, if the situation were flipped and it was Iran and Saudi asking the opposite. I mean, I think that predictability can make uh, China uh, a great partner in some ways, you know, I mean, you know where they stand, you understand what their priorities are and what their objectives are. But I think it's difficult then to say you're a friend because a friend doesn't sell your enemy weapons to use against you. Um, Dr. Wu, finally and quickly from you, you mentioned, you talked briefly before about the, the China straddling Saudi and Iranian relationships um, in the light of what you've just heard. What, 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 um, how difficult is that going to be for China? Dr. Wu there. I don't think so. Um, or is he on mute? I cannot see him. Let me just check. No, no, he's not there, I'm afraid. Look, it's uh, two minutes to uh, 12 or whatever the time zone you're in. Um, so we're, we're going to wind up now. Uh, we're, at, we're at our end point. I'd like to never let anybody tell you that globalization is dead. I'm hosting this from Sydney. We've got Kirsten in DC, Jonathan in Abu Dhabi, Mohammed in Hong Kong, uh, and Wu Bing Bing in Beijing. Um, uh, on behalf of everybody at the Atlantic Council, um, I'd like to thank everybody and um, uh, call an end to the panel. Thank you very much.